Hello and welcome back to the second part of Mr. Jean-Claude Bieber's interview and let's not waste any time and immediately jump into it. Enjoy! And for those who haven't yet uh, seen the first part, well, the link is below. So, uh, anti-conformist, disruptive, yes. uh, different, lifestyle-ish, but uh, with a f kind of a fresh approach to it. Uh, I mean, this uh, made um, what Hublot is today, a huge success, and then got bought. And then? And then it got bought. Yes, because I could buy in the beginning only 20%. And uh, the price Mr. Coco was asking uh, to me for the rest of the shares were too expensive. And uh, finally, in 2007, I decided that I would do a management buyout with the Credit Suisse. And then the, <laughs> the price had gone up. And then he received an offer of LVMH for 496 million because we were doing 49.6 million turnover, uh, profit. And uh, LVMH offered 10 times profit, boom. And of course, 500 million I could not pay. So uh, we had to let the brand go to LVMH. And LVMH uh, bought the brand. Mr. Arno trusted me and the team, the Rublo team. They gave us this necessary freedom to be entrepreneur, to be independent, to have autonomy. Um, and the brand <laughs> didn't stop its growth and grew and grew and grew and grew and grew. You know, when you are owned by, by Swatch Group, by Richemont or by uh, LVMH, the risk that one day there will be no after-sales service is very small. <laughs> so it gives trust, it gives security. Uh, it gives also a certain security to the people who, that work in the company. Because, you know, uh, uh, in difficult times, these groups will help the brand. When the brand is independent, alone, and you have a big crisis during three years, maybe you have to let people go, maybe you're going to close a subsidiary. Uh, well, so it gives also a lot of confidence among the people. And it gives you, if necessary, if possible, it can give you some synergies. Synergies, if you want to open stores, Louis Vuitton and the group LVMH have many stores around the world in best locations. So when you, as Hublot, you ask for a store, a Place Vendôme, and you are independent, and then there is another brand that belongs to LVMH, is asking for the same store, gives the same money, preference will, for, will go probably to LVMH. So it gives us also advantages uh, in advertisement. We have advantages because we can say the group is buying in The Economist so many pages. But from the pure management point of view, as we stayed independent, we kept our autonomy, uh, we kept our people, it didn't bring much. So you took on then a, a next challenge? I mean, next challenge was to help the two other brands, which is Zenit and the Tag Heuer. I took even Tag Heuer as, uh, no, the two. Uh, I was uh, from uh, December 2014 till now, I was uh, CEO ad interim. Maybe I have done the longest ad interim from December 2014 to November 2018. So it's four years as CEO ad interim. Sometimes the CEO doesn't stay four years. I had an interim of four years. I also was a CEO ad interim of Zenit from uh, 2016, uh, yes, 1st of January 2016 uh, till uh, end of 2017. So I had two years. I had four at TAG and two at Zenit. So altogether, I had six years at, at, uh, at interim. And at a certain moment, I had <laughs> uh, three brands more or less to handle. So I did, that was a lot. 
and uh, it's my it was my responsibility to to do that because I was convinced I could do it. Uh, eventually, it was not very reasonable because at the end I had to suffer uh, with my health. I'm still suffering now, um, and that brought my body to say, okay, if your brain wants to handle so much, okay, let the brand go. I will refuse. And so the body said, stop. <laughs> and to the body, I had to listen. <laughs> to my head, I could always say, come on, come on, come on. But then the body, when he doesn't want to get up in the morning, I said, get up. And he said, no, get up. I say no. Then, so the, <laughs> then uh, that's that, that's the end. Uh, uh, uh. But uh, if we go back to to Tag Heuer, I think because this is an interesting case study in a certain way of a yes. brand that thought that okay, at one point maybe you thought could, it could compete against Rolex or something like that. And if you want to compete, Rolex is like if you look in the sun with your uh, with uh, with no glasses. And once you have looked in the sun, then you look back, and then you see nothing anymore. So I always said, never look at Rolex. Rolex, OK, I don't want to look. And I look here. <laughs> so much I believe Rolex, you shouldn't no. But it's great to have them, but don't compete them. No, no, it's a, it's a category <laughs> yeah, for its own. For its own. Yeah, absolutely. So then you kind of recentered uh, the, the the product offering of Tiger yes. Air, making it I mean at the place where it should over yes. has always been you know yes. uh, explain us a little bit how this was perceived also when you took those decisions you know uh, each time you innovate each time you do something different you have the critics that are coming of the people who look who look <laughs> uh, in a mirror the past instead of looking in the future. And they think, we look at the future because the mirror is ahead of my head. No! <laughs> looking in the future doesn't mean to look in the mirror that is one meter ahead. Looking into the future, take the mirror away, and then you look in the future. So we had critics from, the, from this type of people. Uh, what we did was very logical. I mean, uh, Tag Heuer was... Uh, is a stretched brand because it has products at $900 and it has products at 20,000 to say well, they have also at 100 to 200 but till 20,000 they sell nice quantities from 900 to 20,000 that's a stretch in prices that doesn't exist in any other brand there is no brand that is stretched from 900 to 20,000 uh, so, number one, if you are stretched so much, it means also that you have a customer base that is completely stretched too. It means you have people at 18 years old, they buy a $900 watch, but you have also people at 60 that can buy a 20000 So, you have a customer that is totally stretched. So, you have also this problem. You, are, uh, uh, you don't have an equilibrated uh, market shares. Uh, very strong in America, very strong, I think triple of Omega, very strong. And then extraordinary week <laughs> in uh, India and in China. Uh, so you see, <laughs> and then uh, the brand also had movements from their own, movements that they buy, uh, 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 an industry that was not stabilized. And so the challenges was, come on, we cannot immediately uh, bring the scratch down and to make just only one watch. Let's try to have an approach um, where we try to recenter in the category. It means uh, if we have a watch, for instance, the, um, the Formula One, let's have just a few pieces. And then in the Aqua Racer, in the second price category, also less. So we shrinked not the whole collection, but we shrinked the partial collection. We shrinked the Formula One, we shrinked the Aqua Racer, we shrinked the Carrera, 
we shrink the link. Uh, uh, we also try to modernize and to, ha to, uh, to say with the $900 watch, we should attract the young generation. And with the 20,000, we can, okay, sp speak to the 50, 60 years old. But if you speak to the 60 year old guy, it's not the same language than when you speak to the 18 years old guy. So uh, we had to have a double uh, communication, the communication for the young, the communication for the actual customer. Um, we stabilized totally the, the, um, the industry. Tagoya had two chronographs in work. I said, stop, let's do only one, and then we'll see. Um, let's concentrate. Uh, let's restructure also the case manufacturer. Today we have a brilliant case manufacturer that also produces for Hublot and Zenit. So it's the high, very high quality. Uh, we stabilized also the, the, the case uh, factory. We have of, uh, the dial factory. We make dials for Hublot, we make dials for Zenit. We also make dials for some other brands from Richemont or others. So, uh, voila, so I had, a, we did the fundamental work. And now the brand is positioned for the next step. The next step will be more to become more coherent, to concentrate again more. Um, so I think we are now on a, on a great pace to do the second revolution. You went quite uh, a lot down the uh, vintage route uh, with some re-edition or redevelopment. Do you think that this uh, vintage appreciation uh, is there because it's, it's something that reassures people? Uh, no, no, no. Vintage is, is, uh, is, uh, has always been. Vintage comes and goes. Vintage is a trend. And the vintage trend will weaken, but will not disappear. And the vintage trend, once it has weakened, will again go up. That's fashion. Uh, I, I, it's not my first vintage uh, trend that I have seen. And uh, as this vintage trend was there, especially among the young generation, the young people, they love vintage today. Um, uh, I said, but we are so well positioned with TAG for vintage because we have the 50, we have the Monaco that celebrates 50 years. We have the Monza. Uh, we, have, we have the Otavia. <sighs> that's, that's a present from fashion that, give, uh, that comes to us because we have these pieces. Let's do uh, first some efforts in the auctions uh, uh, to promote uh, the the old pieces, the classic watches, but let's do a re-edition of the Monaco with George Bamford, for instance, or with other, other guys, with uh, 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 Hiroshi Fujiwara, uh, because that belongs to us. So we would be stupid not to, uh, to surf on this uh, wave. So if we go really on the opposite, uh, then with TAG, you introduced the, the first kind of luxurious uh, smartwatch? Yes, 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 yes. Luxurious, in, the, uh, in, in any case, it was the, the most expensive one. Uh, the actual one in the titanium is sold 1,750 Swiss francs, which is, which is quite expensive for uh, a connected watch. But it's not so expensive for the Tag Heuer customer because the connected watch is still today the most successful in quantities, the most sold watch of Tag Heuer. Mm -hmm. It's the number one in, in, not in turnover, but in quantities, in numbers. It's still, still today. Every Monday we get the report. Every Monday, number one in, say, in quantities is the connected watch. And very smartly, you had introduced at the time uh, of the introduction of, the, of that smartwatch, the fact that people could go back, uh, do like, uh, go back to a mechanical watch uh, if they weren't satisfied or they wanted to evolve or something like that. Um, how has this uh, uh, project gone? It was, not, uh, we had the modular system. Modular means you can uh, rebuild your watch after three years when you think it's obsolete and you can uh, uh, exchange the module 
uh, from a mechanic uh, from a electronic module into a mechanical one. We were not so very successful, although we thought from a production from our side that that was a great opportunity that you can exchange. Um, and it was not so successful. Why? I think people who bought a connected watch, they didn't care about mechanical. And they, they would even not think about it. You know, it's like if you say to the people who buy an Apple Watch, if, if one day you can put a mechanical movement inside, people would say, I don't want. So you see, when you have a thinking that starts from the producer, you must always be careful that your thinking is accepted by the end consumer. And we have thought about the modular. We were so excited because we thought from our side, wow, it's genius. But we didn't make a study to know how the end consumer would think. And the end consumer was not interested. OK, interesting. So we're going to go forward and talk indeed about uh, uh, Zenith. Uh, Zenith, I mean, it's a beautiful old brand, uh, a lot of uh, legitimacy uh, behind. Uh, uh, but it's been a difficult brand uh, for all the people that have tried to yes. manage it. Can you tell us a little bit about this one? It was a difficult brand because the brand was prisoner of its own tradition. And nobody really had the guts to get out of this tradition. And the tradition was called uh, manufacture, in-house movement. And the tradition was called El Primero. It, they were Ayatollah. El Primero, manufacture, in-house. Uh, OK, if, that's <laughs> if that is the rule, the possibility to explore and to bring novelty is limited. And I thought during one year, I would never find the way uh, to get out of this. And I find, finally, the exit. And I found the exit on a on a stupid thinking. If this was the El Primero in 69, why was it called El Primero? Because it was the first. El Primero means the first. It was the first with one tenth of a second. All right. And it's still the only one. OK, brilliant. Now, what is the future of the first at one tenth? Uh, it would be one hundredth of a second, Mr. Beaver. So, El Primero of the 20th century, I accept, is the El Primero 1, or call it El Primero 69. And the new El Primero, let's call it El Primero 21, like 21st century, will have one hundredth of a second. Then we have still El Primero. The legend is still alive. But we have the legend, Mr. Pele, born in the 20th century, and Mr. Mbappé, born in the 21st. So we have the two. So let's do that. Wow. And we did it. And what was the result? Success. Magic. Enormous. For the numbers of, of Zenith. Enormous success. The future is the X time, the DEFI lab because it has an accuracy that is 10 times better than all the accuracies that exist with the Huygens uh, uh, invention from 1674 or something like that. Uh, and we will be the only one. So we have the future of accuracy, which is our new escapement. And we have the future of chronograph, which is the others. And maybe one day we have the future of minute repeater, which will be so we have now a message. We have a motorway, which is called the future of Swiss traditional watchmaking art. And that's the road we have to go. And once you have the road map, you just have to, to follow and then to drive correctly. If there's a turn, you must turn. If you go straight, you, see, you know. So now we know where, where we drive. Next year, we will produce a few thousand of Defi uh, inventor will be the name. The DEFI lab was for the first 10 for collectors. And then we'll have the DEFI inventor based on the same system with a slightly different look of the escapement. 
but uh, uh, based on the same principles, just with another look in order to leave the people who bought the 10 with their own look. But we have just changed the look. We have not changed the concept, the, the way it works. And we will produce a few thousand. So if we uh, kind of wrap it up in a certain way, uh, today, how would you define the state of mechanical watchmaking? I would define it uh, to, uh, I think mechanical watchmaking has more future than ever. Because we are entering in a period where people want to have to connect to something that is eternal. Everything we do, uh, even the pictures on your phone, uh, one day you, you don't know anymore where they are. Uh, uh, you have Snapchat that where everything disappears after 24 hours. Uh, you have the Instagram uh, also after one day. So we are living in a world where uh, we are connected to extraordinary short-term uh, uh, elements, but we have a lack of eternity. And I think people will want, when I see Jeff Bezos building the biggest clock uh, in, uh, in Texas, in the desert, investing half a billion to make a clock that works uh, 10,000 years. And that's the guy of the cloud. And that's what we invest money, you see? So uh, uh, we will all want to have some connections to eternity. And who can give you a connection to eternity? Art, of course. Picasso is eternal. Uh, art, also music. Uh, Mozart is eternal. The Beatles, even, are eternal. Um, and what else in art? OK, sculptures. But also watchmaking art. Not watchmaking industry, but watchmaking art. So I think the mechanical uh, watches made in Switzerland, which are all more or less high level, high quality, high performance. This, these people who are doing that, they have a lot of future, mm -hmm. more than ever. But uh, today we see, we've entered the, 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 the age, I would say, of the, of the power brands in, in, in watchmaking. I mean, it's obviously very complicated if you're a little underdog today to get out there on the scene. And let's take, I mean, we talked about it just before, but I mean, the, the most obvious example, Rolex. I mean, it's an industrial product. I have no issue with that whatsoever. Uh, they do it really, really well. Uh, but. They're working so fantastically well today uh, uh, on the market, but the notion of art on a Rolex, I mean, is quite far away. It's not so far away when you, when you will see the auction starting tomorrow or the day after tomorrow, and you will notice that the highest price uh, are probably the Rolexes. <laughs> uh, and they were built uh, only 30, 40 years ago and they have reached prices that were unseen. Rolex is like money. If you are in the middle of Botswana uh, and uh, you have no money and you need uh, a few thousand dollars for the helicopter to bring you to the hospital, you can give the watch to, <laughs> to the pilot and he will bring you <laughs> a destination. <laughs> if you give him a wonderful uh, watch that costs 10 times more from a great uh, little artist that nobody knows. Uh, he would say, I don't want this rubbish. Don't, don't you have a Rolex? <laughs> so, uh, well, no, no, I include uh, Rolex uh, in my scale of, of the future. They belong to the future. Oh, for, uh, most certainly. And uh, in terms of evolution, I mean, we've seen also quite a lot of changes in terms of distribution, how people purchase watches. What is your current thought about that? What is changing? The, 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 the consumer is changing. And with the consumer, the habits of this consumer are changing. And suddenly we have uh, 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 the online business. And the online business is changing the traditional watchmaking uh, distribution. And if a traditional uh, uh, watch distributor, uh, jeweler, offers you nothing more than what you can get online, why should a young man drive 120 miles to go to the city 
where he can find a jeweler of the brand when he can buy at home. But if this individual jeweler offers more or other elements or another experience, then eventually you will say, no, no, this watch I have to drive because you will have such an experience. It, it will be an unforgettable moment. So let's drive and go to the jeweler. So things are changing because consumer are changing, because habits are changing. And there is not there is only one way to, to handle these changes is to understand what who is your consumer? What does he want from you? How does he want to buy? What does he want to get? And then once you have understood what the guy wants, you have to adapt. You have to deliver. You know, GD.com told me, Richard Liu, the owner, he was here. He said to me, on the 11th of November, which is the day of, uh, uh, of love, of, 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 uh, voilà, uh, of bachelor, uh, bachelor uh, celibataire, uh, he said to me, we have put 100 Lamborghini on sale at midnight the day on the 11th. And people at, he said to me, do you know, want to know how, many, how long it lasts till I have sold the 100? I said, yes, maybe uh, half a day. He said, 18 seconds. In 18 seconds, they had sold 100 Lamborghinis. You know, and, and, and if you take an uh, old man, uh, he would say, oh, yeah, I have the money to buy a Lamborghini, but I want first to sit in it, to do like this, to look at uh, to, to touch the buttons, the, the uh, a little bit. Yeah, but, but you know, the young people said, they know that they don't need to, you see, they bought, boom, 18 seconds, 100 pieces were gone. <laughs> so, you know, when people say, oh, no, cars you cannot buy online. Come on, why not? Why not? So you must adapt to the new generation, to their new habits. And once you adapt, you can talk with them. If you don't adapt, they will not look at you. But we are indeed very lucky in Switzerland because we kind of monopolize the idea of quality and watchmaking. But there are some other players now that are emerging. What do you think of uh, you know different scenes uh, on the on the watchmaking planet? You know, I probably I mean uh, I just came back from China. I see that in China there are things that you know today people laugh at it a little bit. But within five, ten, twenty years, maybe it will be completely different. There will be a shift of perception. What do you think of those? I mean, the German uh, watchmaking industry that did kind of kick the, the ass a little bit, the Swiss watchmaking industry, like some fifteen, twenty years ago. It all depends of the of us, of the Swiss. If we want to maintain the Swiss made, if we want to maintain the magic to have a Swiss product, like the magic the German have maintained to buy a German car. You could say the same to the German. You know, now I see cars in uh, Korea that are better. I see cars in Japan, uh, blah, blah, blah. The Lexus is competing Mercedes in America. Uh, what do you think? <laughs> the, the magic of being uh, made in Germany for a car, it's the responsibility of the German industry to maintain that. Uh, when I see what they have lost with the diesel, but they have already compensated, and today diesel is forgotten. So it all depends of the of the of, of ourselves. But then, we, when you see example, like for instance, you know what's going on with Basel World and people going out and things like that, and I understand that. I mean, one can question the relevance of such events and uh, I mean, for yes. the cause, this is completely rational. But at the same time, it shows that, you know, it, one of the nice messages that was coming out of it was that the industry is in a certain way a little bit united and things like that. But now, if everyone... It didn't come out. It didn't come out because but we had... We, yeah, but uh, it, it stopped to come out 25 years ago uh, when we had the separation with uh, Geneva. So... Ba if, if Basel should die, they died 25 years ago, <laughs> when suddenly it was not united anymore. That was probably the biggest failure. And now we see the consequences. But the failure started with being divided. And being divided, why? Because of arrogancy. The arrogancy made the division. And these brands who are asking to their customers to, to travel two times from the end of the world to Europe, the CEOs, they don't travel two times in two months 
to that part of the world. But the customer, he can do. That's a total arrogancy. So what do you see as a solution? To have at least the minimum, the two fares starting same day and stopping same day. Like this, customers only travel once. And as Basel and Geneva, you ta it takes you the same time to travel from Geneva to Basel than it takes you from Narita Airport to Tokyo Center. So where is the problem? You can have people sleep two nights in Basel or in Zurich, and then they travel two hours by train, and then they sleep two nights in Geneva. Where's the problem? Zero problem. So minimum, guys, make it the same date. And don't put 60 Swiss francs per person to visit. Make it like the Salon Automobile, like the Automobile Salon in Detroit or in, in Frankfurt or in Geneva or in Paris, and put it at five dollars. Like this, the whole family can come. Yes, I'm much in favor of that. I'm much, very much in favor. I'm a strong believer in the notion of experience. People, you know, they want to touch, feel, yes. and things like that. But now when you go in those fairs, I mean, you're just, you might as well walk in the Rue du Rhône and the Bahnhofstrasse. At least you will, you may be able to touch the, the, these watches and see them in person. What can be done there to have a kind of a stronger interaction? You know, you can touch, uh, when you go to uh, the, the Detroit, the Frankfurt, the Geneva, the Paris show, you can touch uh, Renault Dacia, but you cannot touch Rolls Royce. You cannot touch uh, uh, Bentley. You cannot touch Lamborghini. You cannot sit in every Lamborghini and make <laughs> You cannot touch Ferrari. You cannot touch Bugatti. Tag Heuer, we have shown our connected watch outside our booth. Everybody could touch. Everybody could play. Apple Watch, you can play, but cost $1,000 or $800, uh, and a $100,000 watch, you cannot have it touched by everybody because after eight days, it's not a new watch anymore. And who can afford to have uh, 20 or 50, 100,000 watches to be touched during five days by 100,000 people? But the interaction between uh, uh I mean, I don't know, artisans, watchmakers, and the public? Is that something that... Yeah, that's good. I'm in favor of that. I think the public is missing. I think it would be great to have more people, especially if we're in Switzerland, and to enable also children to come, to make it attractive. <clears throat> this I am in favor. Be it business to consumer, B2C, and not only B2B. Today it's very much concentrated B2B, and I say no. As we are already in Switzerland, let's make it also B2C. Eventually only two days for the customers. But we also need to, to, to be more popular. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. I think it's to maintain, I say, maintain the hype yeah, yeah. in the mechanical watchmaking. Yeah. It's a real mission. Uh, yes. uh. So uh, final question uh, is that, and I will quickly talk about the Apple Watch. Uh, the new Apple Watch has I mean, we know that today you don't buy a watch because you need it, it's because you want to make a little pleasure for yourself. But the new Apple Watch has brought back this dimension of functionality in, yes. in, in, into something on your wrist. It's just brilliant what they brought. It's just brilliant they, because they, they, they are teaching us that you need for your health, that you need for your equilibrium, that you need for, for you. You need information about yourself beside time and they, they are right. I think they are right. I think it's great. But it, they are not competing status symbol. They are not competing dreams. They are not competing beauty. They are not competing exclusivity. <laughs> so uh, uh, it will not harm most of the Swiss brands. It will eventually teach people to wear a Swiss brand also, not at the same moment. I can wear bows. I have bows, by the way. I have bows. I personally, I have bows. Today, I only wear my, my hublot. But I have bows. Because of my health, I have also a, a, an Apple Watch. So for me, it's not a competition. You have in, in Silicon Valley, where are all these 
brilliant CEOs and managers putting their kids in which schools? Schools where there is no iPad, there is no computer, there is no phone. <laughs> so you have the, immediately, the market always corrects. And if you get addicted, and if you go to the opera tonight, you will one day want to go with another watch than your Apple Watch. So you can have the Apple Watch for the day or for traveling, and you can have a, a great watch for other reasons, for the unrational reasons. And the unrational reasons for many human beings are the most beautiful ones. Because to be the whole day linked to rationality, after a moment you want dreams, you want irrational. And art is irrational. Love is irrational. The most beautiful things in, in life is art and love. And that's irrational. So uh, the more you will be linked to rationality, the more you will want to escape and to have at least a few moments of dream, a few moments of irrationality. And that's where we are. The Swiss watch industry is mostly driven, not only, but mostly driven by the beauty of irrationality. I like this idea. <laughs> so now you're uh, stepping down from operational uh, roles at the, the, the head of uh, the LVMH watch div division, but you're still a very passionate man. Uh, yes, the passion, passion cannot retire. You can retire from a job. You cannot retire from a passion. And so from my passion, I have not retired. I still have uh, every day my cortisone and I have some uh, chemotherapy once a week with an injection. Um, it seems, if I listen to the doctors, that by Christmas I will be free of cortisone and free of these chemo injections. Then I will start to think. As long as I'm like, like I'm now, I look maybe okay, but uh, I'm not 100% okay because I need this cortisone and I need the injection. When I will be free, we will see. <laughs> so till then, I don't know. Well, best of luck for you and thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Okay, so I hope now that you have a much broader understanding of who is Mr. Beaver, what his role and influence has brought to the watchmaking industry. And as mentioned a few times, well, he definitely holds his place in this uh, watchmaking hall of fame. Thanks for watching, more good stuff coming and see you real soon. Viva Watchmaking!